We're just finding out that quantitative easing is very, very powerful in pushing around bond deals and bond prices. We certainly are proud to have one of the largest retail allocations ever. Our offices are revolving into more hybrid spaces, more flexible working. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Beats and buybacks. BNP Paribas sees a rebound in equities as NatWest announced a plan to return capital after reversing loan loss provisions. We'll hear from both banks. Renault's restructuring starts to pay off. The French car maker beats in the first half even as the chip crunch crimps its outlook. We'll speak with the CEO shortly. And Amazon fails to deliver. The e-commerce giant set to slump after missing estimates for the first time since 2018. So let's bring you some economic data just crossing the terminal. German second quarter GDP 1.5%. The estimate was 2%, so that is indeed a miss. Look, we saw a similar picture with U.S. GDP yesterday as well, but within that there were some strong places as well. So we'll dive through this data, see exactly what missed and where the strong parts might be. Of course, German inflation also a concern for these markets at the moment as well. And let's get straight to the markets. It's a busy week of earnings in Europe, and it's coming to a close with numbers from big banks, energy companies, and manufacturers coming in thick and fast. Now, just this morning, we spoke to the CFO of BNP Paribas after the French bank saw an uptick in its equity trading business, but a decline in FIC income. The levels of 2020 were extraordinarily high, and so there is a reduction. And this reduction, what we are seeing, is in line with what you see if you take the European and the U.S. banks. Now, at the same time, NatWest says it aims to distribute a minimum of one billion pounds a year from 2021 to 2023. It'll do that by a combination of ordinary and special dividends. Strong performance across all of our businesses driven by an increase in lending with mortgage growth. The, the mortgage market here remains very strong. And as we come out of lockdown, consumer spending is starting to recover back to pre-COVID levels. What we're seeing is, you know, very low level of default, defaults. Businesses have been remarkably resilient. There's a lot of support still in the economy. But as we come out of lockdown, confidence is coming back. Well, let's get further into this earnings discussion. Joining us now is Maria Vaitmana, senior multi-asset strategist at State Street. Maria, thanks so much for joining us. A very volatile and busy week. You're joining us here on the tail end of. I do want to pick up, though, just on those comments from the NatWest CEO who said, look, we've seen a very low level of defaults. And this is something we've heard from a lot of European banking CEOs. So, Maria, did we just kind of skip the default cycle here or are they just to come? No, I, I, I probably, yeah, I have a lot of sympathy with what uh, NatWest was, was was talking about. I mean, we are living in a world where money are virtually free, <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. almost kind of difficult for, bank, for, for for anyone to default. I mean, you have very, very easy access to capital, so we know financial conditions are unprecedentedly super accommodative. And what actually we've seen in, in the numbers is that lots and lots of corporates have been able to borrow at a lower rate. Lots and lots of consumers have been able to borrow rate. We lengthen the duration of um, of, uh, of of those loans, of, of, of credit. So it, it does set companies in a very, very good stead to, to continue uh, kind of their investment plans, their growth plans. So that's great for the companies. I'm not entirely sure how great it is for banks. I mean, yes, low, quality mm. of the loan books has improved great but they actually locking in into fairly low interest margins for quite some time so we do have some worries on that front so okay it's, it's good not mm. to default but giving out like very very cheap money for long term that that might be an issue longer term but not yet yeah fair enough yeah fair enough and look these these companies certainly do have strong balance sheets they have lots of cash how do you see that cash being put to work this quarter we certainly see a lot of dividends, a lot of buybacks. Is that where that extra cash sitting on balance sheets is going to be going? Yeah, I suspect a lot of it will be returned to shareholders. But what we are actually really, really excited in this earnings season and what we heard from a lot of companies is uh, increasing talk about CapEx. That's really, really exciting. I mean, we know that companies, particularly like industrial companies, uh, have been underinvesting for quite a long time, for almost a decade, if you kind of detrend the series. So 
potential for investment is really, really exciting, and that can create a long-term kind of stable and more profitable profitable growth. And it's not that it's only that they can invest, they actually have to invest. I mean, we heard a lot of about reshoring, rebuilding supply chains, kind of investing into, uh, into kind of more stable production. So those things can happen and need to happen. And companies in very, very unique, uh, unique opportunity to be able to do it. So that's, that's really exciting. Hmm. Okay, so what sector then are you seeing that and are you excited about? Mm. I mean, industrial look really good, so so they're probably kind of the biggest biggest recipient of it. Mm. Uh, a lot of consumer stuff, like uh, like places like autos, maybe like durable. So so that, that that's potentially very very interesting. M majority of them, I would probably say, in cyclical sectors, uh, kind of old economy cyclical sectors. We know tech has been investing for for years and will probably continue. So they're probably on 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 the margins that a bit less kind of a bigger story, but kind of old economy cyclicals that we kind of haven't looked at very, very favorably for, for quite hmm. some time. That interest is coming back there. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because we also heard from uh, Bernstein yesterday putting out a note saying, look, European uh, value, not only is it cheap, but it has bigger growth potential, earnings growth potential than its U.S. Yep. counterparts. Maria, are you, are you a buyer of European value as well? Uh, with reservations. So there are some parts mm. of European value we really like. So so kind of those, those kind of industrial consumer cyclicals we really, really like. Banks were a little bit more concerned and exactly for the reason we kind of talked about, about the kind of locking in into lower interest margins, how far, it, I mean, we do expect obviously recovery and uh, uh, interest rates probably will recover from kind of current slump and will maybe go a bit higher, but probably not too, too high. And then banks really, really need it. So I think we, part of value is really interesting and I, I really hear what Bernstein is talking about so mm. European uh, stocks in general European cyclicals what they want they have lots of operating leverage they're exporters they want they need global economic recovery and that's kind of exactly what we're having uh, better economic growth around the world and Europe is really really good place to uh, kind of play this story Right. Maria, thanks so much. You're going to stick around with us. We have much more to discuss. That's Maria Vaitmana from State Street. Now, coming up, Amazon's pandemic boost starts to fade as vaccinated shoppers venture out. The world's biggest e-commerce retailer predicts slower sales growth. We're going to discuss that up next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now let's get to the first word news. Here's Leanne Gerens. Good morning, Leanne. Good morning, Danny, and thank you. Japan plans to expand a state of emergency to areas around Tokyo and extend it to the end of August in the face of a record surge in virus cases. The country has so far suffered fewer COVID deaths than any other G7 nation, but only about a quarter of the population is now fully vaccinated. Cases directly linked to the Olympic Games do, however, remain relatively low. Now, officials overseeing the transition away from LIBOR in the US have formally endorsed a series of forward-looking benchmarks. The announcement should pave the way for the widespread use of the interest rates from CME Group, which are tied to the secured overnight financing rate. It comes just five months ahead of the deadline to ditch LIBOR for new deals. Now, Israel will offer a COVID booster shot to people over 60 who've already been fully vaccinated. That makes it the first country to offer a third dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine to its citizens on a wide scale. The decision comes at a time when infections are indeed rising. Neither the US or the EU have approved booster shots. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts and more than in 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Danny. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, on to Amazon, which says it expects slower sales growth in the third quarter as the boost from the pandemic subsides. Customers turned to Amazon and uh, other online platforms during the COVID crisis, and that led to a record profit for the e-commerce giant. But Amazon's breakneck growth is beginning to level as customers start to return to the high street. Amazon shares dropping in pre-market so far. 
Star. Maria Vetmana from State Street is still with us. So, Maria, during the pandemic, when a lot of shares were selling off last March, it was really tech that kind of led us through the market, kept things afloat. Does the leadership start to shift now that the economy is going to normalize? Yeah, I, th I think that's been quite a, quite a big story, probably like more in the Q1 this year when we said, okay, what what, what else other than tech? And we had quite a lot of like cyclical industrial uh, commodities do, do, doing better. What was interesting in Q2 is that actually market ca came back to tech. Uh, as hmm. So every time we have any kind of pand pandemic scare, we have um, uh, growth scare or like uh, new new variants coming back. So that that almost naturally kind of leads, uh, leads investor back to tech. They benefit from lower interest rates. They benefit from uh, any kind of indications that we might have more lockdowns, which we're seeing that quite a lot of like in Asian markets. So, uh, mm. yeah. So technology, I, I would, I mean, what I'm trying to say basically is that I probably wouldn't write a tech sector off. And I mean, thinking about Amazon companies that makes 50% earnings growth and market is disappointed. I mean, I, I, I feel a little bit like we're getting a bit too greedy with it. But I mean, right. all technology sectors had a fantastic earnings. Yes, they're talking about potential risk and returning to some sort of normal rate of growth, not 50, 40%. That's obviously excessive, but... Um, uh, it is a sector that can make money in downturn and an upturn. So I think we probably, yeah, it's too early to write it off. So you wouldn't write off tech, but would you write off China tech at this point, Maria? Yeah, China tech is actually very, and, uh, and thanks for bringing it up. It's very, very specific story, right? So it, it probably has a lot less kind of read across to global tech. So it's about uh, Chinese government wanting to have control over what big tech giants are allowed to, to do, whether they're allowed to cross between uh, uh, tech and finance and which parts of the, uh, of the economy they can go and how much control the government can uh, will continue to exert over them. So that's very, very specific. Uh, that, that's on China. What I would probably say, thinking about Asian tech, is that Korea and Taiwan, the kind of powerhouses of semiconductor industry, they still look very, very interesting. And um, so, I, 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 as, as with always, we have to be a bit more selective, but the China tech is very, very specific issue. I would probably venture to say that it's probably not very systemic issue, given it's uh, kind of investors begin to get a grip and understanding is, uh, okay, that's, that's part of the economy. And uh, Chinese government wants to have a control, but they still want to have the economy growing strongly and be investor friendly. Right. Um, so, I mean, speaking of trying to keep the economy growing, uh, mm -hmm. I, I wonder kind of what you do with some of the divergence in terms of GDP growth. Uh, you have China maybe expressing mm. some concerns, or there had been some concerns around growth in GDP. I mean, do you see a big divergence between regions? In other words, do we not get that uh, altogether sort of economic growth throughout the world? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a really interesting. And I think may, maybe the question is, for, for, for years, we had China and kind of commodity-led boom. That being the main engine, uh, engine of growth uh, globally, and that was uh, really, really important. What we're beginning to see is a kind of the center, the kind of engine is shifting maybe towards Western economies right now. So US and maybe Europe, they're talking a lot about kind of stimulating the economy. We know interest rates are super, super mm -hmm. low, but the government talking about extra investment, infrastructure spending, that's keep gathering momentum. I mean, if you think back to so GFC, the way to get out of crisis was austerity. Now the kind of the accepted uh, kind of mantra is that we have to spend out our, uh, out of crisis, and governments are increasingly looking into it. So I suspect it's the center of gravity is changing. Um, hmm. It's uh, a lot more. Um, I mean, it's it's affects sectors you you buy, it affects your investment opportunities. I think it's really interesting to look at European equities right now. In 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 that sense, they they I mean, very kind of industrial heavy, so they're manufacturer heavy as we produce things in Europe. They should benefit from from from, from that environment. Right, Maria. So great to have you on today. A happy Friday. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. That's Maria Veitmana, senior multi-asset strategist at State Street. Thanks again for joining us. Now, coming up, we discuss Robinhood, which flops on the first day of trading. We're going to hear from the firm's CEO and dig in to why exactly they had that flop. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
it's really humbling uh, that six short years after we launched our, our product to the public, um, we have over 22 million customers and we're on this journey with our customers and uh, allowing them to participate in, uh, in the offering. And speaking of your customers, you said you'd allocate 20 to 35 percent for Robinhood's own users. We're hearing that somewhere in the range of 20 to 25 percent, still one of the biggest allocations ever. How did you get to that number? And, and are you concerned at all about volatility? Well, uh, we, we certainly are proud to have one of the largest retail allocations ever. And um, the way that we think about it is it's a long-term focused company and we're making decisions and making big bets uh, with the long-term interest of the business in mind. So um, volatility you know, comes and goes and we're, we're not gonna be commenting too much on daily fluctuations of the stock price. The retail movement though is a phenomenon, the meme stock movement, a phenomenon. And looking at social media just this morning, there are strong feelings out there about what Robinhood represents. When you think about GameStop, when you think about AMC, AMC, do you get at all worried about Robinhood becoming a target of its own users? Yeah, we're, we're not really thinking again about, you know, anything that uh, happens in the, in the market, especially in the short term. The, the goal is to keep making great products, to keep improving the service, and keep growing with our customers. And I think we've We've seen certainly finance become more important and the retail investor become much more important within investing. And that's, that's something we think will continue. You live streamed your roadshow to the public. You said that more products are coming, maybe even retirement accounts like IRAs. When should investors expect those kind of things? Well, one of the things that we've been really excited about is turning first time investors into long term investors. You can see that with some of the recent products that we've launched. It started with fractional shares, but then we built on top of that foundation with things like recurring investments, where if you're a customer, you can put in an order to buy a particular stock or ETF on a regular basis. And we're gonna continue investing in that. We're seeing really, really good adoption, and we'd like to see uh, a large portion of our activity be kind of long-term investing in the future. Robinhood CEO Vlad Tenef there speaking to Bloomberg's Emily Chang about the firm's market debut. And it was not a very well-received debut, at one point dropping as much as 12%. So let's get into this more now. Joining us is Bloomberg intelligence analyst Matt Bloxham. So Matt, a drop of more than 12% at one point. It ends down as well. How would you characterize the tepid reception for the IPO? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a mixture of things going on there. I mean, I think it was to some degree just a bit mispriced and maybe there was some tension there between uh, the underwriters and the, the founder investors about where it should be struck. And um, yeah, also, as we heard a bit from there from Emily, you know, I think um, a few missteps before the IPO from Robin Hood um, about some of the volatility we've seen in the market. So, you know, perhaps not the most enthusiastic investor base that they might have expected and you know markets are feeling a bit toppy so I think just a combination of factors in the short term that have kind of uh, made this a little bit of a kind of underwhelming debut but you know I think the democratization of trading is definitely a kind of a long-term theme that um, could play out quite well for them ultimately. All right, Matt, I'm going to make you maybe do kind of a hard pivot here from Robin Hood to a very different kind of media, mm -hmm. and that's, of course, Disney. I mean, this was one of our most read stories of ScarJo suing Disney because they streamed Black Widow the same day it was available in theaters, crimping some of her profit. Disney had a very punchy response as well, saying, calling it sad and distressing and the callous disregard for the prolonged effects of the pandemic. I mean, it, it seems like maybe not a great strategy to pick a fight with a very beloved celebrity for Disney. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting that this is kind of uh, spilled out into the public domain and a number of similar issues have been settled out of court. But it just goes to show that the, um, the digital transformation that the pandemic has accelerated is affecting a lot of industries. And I think the way that the kind of economics of films, and we're seeing similar in music, has changed fundamentally. I think Scarlett Hansen's contract was struck in 2017 before any of this was going on, and theatres were, you know, uh, doing billion-dollar-plus 
um, receipts. So I think it's going it, to, I mean, it's already going on, but I think it's going to really prompt a massive rethink about how movie stars contracts are struck. There's going to have to be a shift towards uh, streaming. And, you know, we're, we're seeing that in music too. We've got uh, Universal Music planning to go public um, in September. and We've got similar issues going on there between artists uh, and these platforms and, and how the value splits between them. So I think, you know, this is hmm. the start of quite an interesting period uh, for the content industry. Yeah, fascinating stuff there. I have to say, I did not watch Black Widow in theaters or streaming, but definitely need to to uh, see exactly what's being sued over. Matt, thank you so much. Thanks to Matt Bloxham from Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, coming up, mandating vaccines for the return to office. We'll discuss the future of the workplace. This is Bloomberg. Beats and buybacks, BNP Paribas sees a rebound in equities as NatWest announces a plan to return capital after reversing loan loss provisions. We're going to hear from both banks. Renault's restructuring starts to pay off. The car maker beats in the first half even as the chip crunch crimps its outlook. We speak to the CEO shortly. And Amazon fails to deliver. The e-commerce giant is set to slump after missing estimates for the first time since 2018. Well, good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now, a huge week for earnings in NatWest among them, beating expectations for the second quarter and now planning to return cash to shareholders. Bloomberg caught up with the CEO, Allison Rose, earlier this morning. What we're seeing is a good recovery in the economy as, as we open up. So we're cautiously optimistic about the recovery, but, but strong performance across all of our businesses driven by an increase in lending with mortgage growth. The, the mortgage market here remains very strong. And as we come out of lockdown, consumer spending is starting to recover back to pre-COVID levels. And our commercial business continues to provide strong support. So what we're seeing is, you know, very low level of default defaults. Businesses have been remarkably resilient. There's a lot of support still in the economy. But as we come out of lockdown, confidence is coming back and we see more optimistic outlook for the economy and very low levels of default. But, uh, you know, a strong and resilient performance. And obviously, we have a very strong capital position, a capital accretive Position, so that allows us to uh, pay dividends and capital distributions to shareholders. Good morning, Alison. As you said, it's some great results across the board there. And I can see that there's a plan of a £750 million buyback in the second half of this year. If the next quarter is just as strong and you continue to accumulate these excess uh, capital, what will you do with that excess capital? Will you accelerate buyback programmes further beyond what the government's directing? Or will you uh, turn to M&A or some other way of returning capital to shareholders? Yeah, we've set a medium term target to be at a 13 to 14 percent CET one ratio, which is, is the right shape for a business like ours with very good risk diversification and, and a balanced book. So we have a clear path and my clear preference is to distribute capital to shareholders, but also to continue to invest for growth within our business. And we're seeing you know, good growth across that and potential for more organic growth. And then we will also consider any other options that add to shareholder value. But I think hopefully what we've given to the market is a clear indication of a steady capital return. We're investing three billion into the business for growth over the next three years in our digital transformation. And we will always consider options that add shareholder value as well. What are NatWest's plans for office space if work from home or at least a hybrid structure is more the future? Will you keep your Bishopsgate campus and your Edinburgh campus? Um, yes, we will keep those two campuses. I mean, we're evolving our um, working into a more hybrid way of working. I think certainly COVID has busted a few myths about how you can work. Um, we were able to get 50,000 people working from home and continue to support, you know, good operational performance and customer support during that period. So our, our, our offices are revolving into more hybrid spaces, more flexible working, um, but there will always need, uh, always be a need for offices. There will always uh, be a need for collaboration and, and bringing people together. So our, our footprint will evolve, but, you know, uh, our two big campuses are not going to change. 
NatWest CEO Allison Rose there speaking with Bloomberg's Mark Cudmore and Anna Edwards earlier this morning. Now, Jeffries is mandating that employees who wish to return to its office must be fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Google and Facebook announced similar measures, and Citigroup has gone back to requiring staff to wear masks. Now, the highly contagious Delta variant is throwing doubt over a broad post-summer return to the workplace. But global real estate investment manager LaSalle sees office space remaining important to corporate. Operations. Let's speak now to LaSalle's head of European research, Brian uh, Klinsik. Brian, so great to have you on this morning. Uh, so you've just released uh, your new outlook for the market, office space still attractive, but what is the resurgence of the Delta variant and some of these more uneven plans of returning to the office mean for the outlook for the sector? Look, what matters for real estate is not uh, days and weeks, it's quarters and years. And I like to say that, you know, even though we have the complication of the Delta variant and different countries are seeing bigger surges than others, um, it, it, to use a kind of Olympic metaphor, we've been watching a marathon, but it's going to be a photo finish. Um, we see the conditions for a really strong rebound for uh, real estate, including the office sector. Yeah, that's really fair. I mean, it is easy to kind of get caught up in the in the day to day. Who is letting their employees back in? How are they letting them back in? But but as we do get this slow return, does the way that the office looks and the central business district, does that have to change compared to what it looked like before the COVID outbreak? Yeah, the fundamental question, uh, if you zoom out, isn't the future of the office narrowly. It's what is the future of in-person interaction? Um, the pandemic has accelerated trends towards having more choice in where we live, where we work, where we shop. But uh, there's something special about being in person with people. We, we've seen a resounding return, a resounding yes to that answer, the question of whether in-person interaction is special by people returning to socialize with one another as soon as restrictions are lifted. But that doesn't mean the office is going to be the same, and it has to be focused on sort of accentuating the strengths of being in person together. That's about collaboration. That's about creating a sense of FOMO, fear of missing out on something special that's happening by being together. You know, I, I also think there's a, a smoothie shop right outside of Bloomberg, and I was there the other day, and the owner there was just saying, look, there's no one coming in here, even though people have started to return. I mean, it's, it's still decimate. They said they were barely breaking even. What do you do right now with those retail spaces that kind of exist around the office place? Will those continue to be strong as they once were? Well, the, you know, the, the retail spaces in central business districts are an area that will struggle a bit if people are coming into the work, coming into the office three or four days a week instead of five. And so um, I think it, we need a, a land, landlords need a strategy and cities need a strategy to add a, a more variety and a, a life to those spaces. So more independent retailers, more independent uh, F&B outlets, and really enhance that sense of FOMO and vibrancy and not mm. just another quick grab sandwich shop to have at your desk. <laughs> I do love a quick uh, sandwich run, though, I must say. Uh, Brian, when it comes to housing, are we at peak housing demand in Europe and the UK? Uh, I mean, the fundamentals of housing markets in Europe are really one of a structural undersupply. And so the run up in prices and activity that we've seen has just been people accelerating choices that they were going to make anyways about uh, the stage in their life, places to have extra space for their kids. Um, that's been accelerated. But the fundamental, you know, if you tot up the, num the, the demand and the supply, there is still an underlying shortage. And so while activity may fall back a bit, uh, we see, you know, continued strength in residential markets. And it's one of our favorite sectors across Europe. Brian, I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but it was great to speak to you today. That's Brian Klinsik, head of European Research at LaSalle. Thanks so much for joining. And some breaking news to bring you. We do have a China Politburo meeting chaired by President Xi going on. Uh, some headlines out of that. China Pol Politburo to improve overseas listings uh, supervision system. This, of course, comes in the wake of Didi and other IPO scrutiny that have listed in the U.S. Uh, they're also supporting faster development of the EV sector, so that's certainly relevant 
relevant. We will be speaking with Renault just shortly. Uh, China Politburo also urging stabilization for housing prices and expectations. So again, this comes uh, as we're expecting the China Politburo to hold a meeting on the second half economic work. So we'll continue to keep an eye on that and any headlines coming up. Now, as I mentioned, Renault feeling the chip shortage pain. The French car maker says rising costs could curb further recovery and profitability this year. Shares, though, moving higher after earnings that beat expectations. Up next, we speak to its CEO, Luca DeMeo. If you have any questions for him, IB plus TV Go on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. I think we have overcome chip shortages so far quite well, so we could manage, we could rearrange. It's out of our control, essentially. It does seem like it's getting better, um, but uh, it's hard to predict. We've worked hard on the supply chain. There's no question there's a lot of work to do in the supply chain for semiconductors. It is certainly better than it was, and I expect it will continue to get better with each month as we move further away from the disruptions caused by the pandemic. It's really annoying because we have a lot of customers wanting to buy our cars and we would like to build more and sell more. Uh, so as, I, as you said there, um, we don't see really that that's going to improve. We're still seeing more demand right. than supply across our business, but things are continue to improve on the supply side. But fundamentally, the only way to solve this problem is that we need to make more semiconductors in America. Some of the key voices this week addressing the global chip crunch. And Renault is the latest automaker to address this, the chip shortage concerns. The French car manufacturer has doubled its estimate for car production, lost to supply chain disruption. Renault now expects semiconductor constraints to see output drop 200,000 vehicles this year. Let's get more into that. We're joined now by CEO of Renault, Luca De Meo. Uh, Luca is a man with more than two decades experience in the auto industry. And I should say, before joining Renault, he was the CEO of Seat for five years, and before then, he worked for other automakers like VW, Fiat, and Toyota. His appointment as Renault CEO in 2020 sent him back to where he started his career. Luca DeMeo, welcome to Bloomberg. And I say all of that uh, because it's a strange time in the auto industry now, given the chip shortage. And of course, your experience means that you have a very unique view of this. Just how acute is the chip shortage and how long do you see it lasting? Uh, good, good morning, Danny. Unfortunately, it's 30 years of experience. I'm getting old, not 20, <laughs> as you said, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, so, so uh, of course, this uh, this issue of, of semiconductor is uh, annoying. Uh, you know, everybody in the automotive industry. You've seen some of the declaration of uh, of my colleagues. The good news is that, despite the fact that we had a, you know a higher impact that we initially anticipated, the results uh, of, of of Renault are completely on track with our plan. So we got back. We're back uh, to profitability. Uh, so this is uh, certainly good news. And we we actually anticipated at the beginning a recovery already from. Uh, quarter three of this year, but now that we are in, we know we see that uh, there are of, of the difficulties and the problem continue, and we are maybe seeing a recovery on uh, on Q4. That means that we won't be able to catch up and get back to the hundred thousand units losses that we uh, planned uh, uh, at the beginning. This is basically the situation, but uh, we will endeavor this, uh, the, the you know, this uh, supply chain constraints, and we'll try to continue. Uh, to, to stay at this mm. level of uh, profitability this year. Uh, this was uh, the, you know, the in, in, at the end of the message uh, in, in our guidance uh, in the analyst conference this morning. So, so Luca, just be clear. So, per, so, so the chip crunch perhaps clearing up in the fourth quarter. Of course, we still have issues of the Delta variant COVID, COVID spreading. What are the risks to that outlook specifically? I think that the one, two of them you mentioned, the chip, the chip shortage will continue probably throughout. I would say maybe first semester of 2022 will have some, let's say, some fluctuation, some uncertainty, and lack of visibility. Uh, we have, of course, uh, the, the pandemic is not completely over, especially in some markets where we have. Uh, 
in the supply chain uh, production capacity for some of the components. We're seeing that, for example, in, in, in Malaysia having uh, impact uh, on us. And there is another thing that uh, will probably hit the industry more on the, sec on the second semester, which is the growth of uh, raw material price that is kicking in right now, mm. uh, which we anticipate in the order of five to 600 million euro for, for Renault. But this is part of the calculation uh, in our guys, though everything has been integrated. And we say that we try to stay at least at, the, at this level for the end of the year, which by the way, 2.8%, uh, uh, let's say, um, operational margin is, uh, is uh, what we promised to the market by the end of 2023. And we are achieving that level, you know, with two years and a half of, of advance. So we keep fighting. It's a very challenging environment, but that makes the thing interesting. Right. And one of the challenges, as you mentioned, of course, is that raw material price increase. How are you passing those prices along to customers? Uh, partially, we have already anticipated this thing, but it's also part of a strategy of improving the quality of, of our sales, which had a huge impact uh, on uh, our capacity of, uh, uh, you know, really showing an improvement on net pricing. Uh, for your reference, we, compared to last year, we were up 8.7% in average in terms of net pricing, I don't know, which is a pretty remarkable performance. But it's not only justified by the fact that uh, cars are getting more content and and, 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 and raw materials are, are increasing their prices also because we decided to abandon some unprofitable channels, uh, markets, models, because uh, we put focus uh, on, on value creation uh, and uh, kind of abandon the approach of, you know, only looking for uh, sheer growth because that was mm. bringing the company in a very complicated situation. Don't forget that last year we lost uh, uh, many, many billions of uh, of euro, more than 7 billion euros. And so this is, uh, we are actually back from hell with this, uh, let's say, first semester. And it went quicker than we uh, anticipated, which is a good news. Well, I know in your strategy update in January and, and, and earlier this month, you also expressed a desire to get into the Chinese market as well. Um, are you concerned considering some of the latest clampdown from the Chinese government? Uh, does that change your strategy to expand beyond Europe at all? Well, I think that, uh, you know, Ch China is, uh, uh, you know, the biggest market in the world. Uh, we are almost nowhere there if i would say because we kind of decided to last year to completely change the strategy but i think that uh, a brand a global brand like renault without a presence in china uh, is uh, not an acceptable concept so but we have to find a way to get back uh, in a different way with uh, a proposition that is more progressive that uh, and adding something to the uh, equation so we are not going to try to come in the traditional way also because i think that china sets a lot of uh, you know trends in the automotive business both from a consumer point of view also from a technology point of view so being there means uh, you know staying very close to the real evolution of the automotive market it's very very important but we'll come with hmm. uh, maybe some ideas and some plans when uh, when when the time comes i mean do you think it's fair to say that you know the reliance on europe has to kind of be overcome in order to maybe catch up with some of your rivals like vw for example yeah, for sure, for sure. We are, we are actually 50-50 between uh, Europe and international markets. So naturally, naturally, uh, Renault is a, is a company that's made its internationalization process already starting uh, in, in the 90s. So we are not completely unbalanced, but we don't have uh, the U.S. market. And we right now, we don't have the Chinese market. So for sure, there is the ambition to get back to, you know, a, a global footprint, but we have to do it right at the right time with the, with the right uh, approach and that's what we are working on all right luca thank you so much for joining us this morning that's luca de Mayo, ceo of reno with 30 years in the industry of experience i should say now coming up one week into the tokyo olympics the host nation is second in the medals table but importantly the public is changing its mind about the games we'll get the latest from the japanese capital this is bloomberg
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now, the first week of Japan's Olympics is coming to a close, and the host nation is currently second on the medals table. Some of the stories of the week, uh, Suni Lee's victory in the all-around gymnastics event following Simone Biles' withdrawal, the tiny island of Bermuda claiming its first ever gold medal in the triathlon, and two 13-year-olds from Japan and Brazil taking gold and silver in the women's skateboarding. I love that. Love to watch skateboarding. But controversy has also followed the Tokyo Games. But one week of top-tier sport, is it starting to change people's minds? Joining us now to discuss is Grace Wang, our reporter in Tokyo. All right, so Grace, is that fair to say? Is there a change in opinion about hosting the Games in Japan? Yeah, actually, I see a gradual change, especially uh, if you are uh, analyzing the Twitter t uh, tweets, uh, then you will see uh, about actually uh, positive comment towards the game improved about 10% uh, compared with uh, before starting the game. So I definitely see there's uh, improvement. And uh, I think there are several reasons for this. One is that uh, people uh, towards the opening ceremony, there were uh, events to sort of like cheer up the game, such as uh, Japan's uh, def self-defense force had it is aircraft uh, acrobat team to perform us uh, fly through the sky and the fireworks at the ceremony these things are really uh, making the Twitter uh, into people's tweet so these are the positives and with more gold medals uh, Japanese players uh, bring back home and share that excitement with people you can see citizens are posting more positive comments toward this game and how well is Japan containing the pandemic as the game goes on and, and quickly here Grace yeah, actually, it hasn't been uh, wild. Uh, Tokyo has been, you know, uh, has hit record high in newly found cases. Uh, so far, the Olympics Village has been able to contain the virus fairly well compared with the, uh, the, the rest of Tokyo. Grace, thank you so much. That's Grace Wang, our reporter in Tokyo, keeping track of the Olympics for us. And we are just seeing a market continuing to end the week on a very sour note. Stock 600 down half a percent. And we're going to continue the market conversation on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition in the next hour. Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines, both in New York, they will join me from there. Along with the market action, we, of course, have a lot of earnings to get through. This is Bloomberg. It's a long-term focused company, and we're making decisions and making big bets uh, with the long-term interest of the business in mind. There is an overall way of handling through digital, through the way of handling and the vaccination that we anticipate that that rebound uh, will crystallize. Businesses have been remarkably resilient. There's a lot of support still in the economy, but as we come out of lockdown, confidence is coming back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua, Matt Miller, and Keely Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Friday, July 30th. Our top stories today, Amazon's pandemic profits may fade away. Vaccinated shoppers are now starting to brave the great outdoors. Rough opening for Robinhood. Shares of the popular trading app fall flat in their debut. Presidential power hits a wall. Why, there's only so much Joe Biden can do to fight the pandemic. I'm Danny Berger in London, alongside Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines, both in New York. Francine Lacqua is off this week. And Kaylee, it is a risk-off day to end a very volatile week. Yeah, it is, Danny. We definitely saw that playing out in the Asian session, even with news out of the China Politburo that they are going to improve supervision on overseas listings. Not yet clear what that means, but we'll have more on that in just a moment. Broadly, though, stocks were lower in Asia, including in China, and the Nikkei was down about 1.8 percent, the Hang Seng by 1.4 percent. And the Hang Seng Tech Index, which has seen an incredibly volatile week, also saw that dip buying really stalling out. That index was down about 2.5 percent. One individual stock to keep an eye on from the Asian 
possession is China Evergrande, of course, the indebted property developer that has been in some trouble as of late. A court freezing assets for its listed onshore subsidiary, so that stock fell about 8% in the Asian session. And in NFX, your big underperformer in Asia was the South Korean won, weaker against the dollar by about a third of a percent, just around its weakest level in about 10 months. Here in the U.S., of course, we saw that second quarter outlook uh, or the outlook for Amazon really missing expectations after the bell last night. That is dragging heavily on futures, most notably the Nasdaq 100, uh, with futures down more than one percentage point. We are seeing yields tick lower. The 10-year Treasury yield down about two basis points. We're sitting south of 125. And I would note the Bloomberg Commodity Spot Index is back at its highest level since 2011. Part of that is due to higher crop prices because of the weather. But part of that story, too, Matt, is the weaker dollar. The dollar weaker for a fifth day had for its worst week since May, Matt. Yeah, you know what? I feel like that's kind of uh, an up arrow story. There's a little bit of risk on sentiment. You can see it play through in the dollar. You can see it play through in bond yields as well because we have some positive news. European GDP just crossing the Bloomberg terminal right now. A gain of 2%. The estimate was for 1.5%, so better than expected. The same is true with European inflation at 2.2%, better than expected and up there where the ECB wants it to be. There were some disappointments if you look at individual countries. For example, Germany only had GDP growth of 1.5% and we were looking for 2%, but Italy had 2.7% and Spain had 2.8%, so big strong growth in the perif. Let's take a look at what's going on in the markets. As I said, you get a little bit of a risk on feel from the German Bund. It's coming back, still negative 44 basis points, but at least it's gaining. The pound is gaining as well. The euro is up, powering through 119 as the dollar um, weakness lets those uh, currencies come up. And then you've got some positive stories. Unicredit, for example, in Italy had double the profit that it had last year, beat the streets estimates, lifted um, its forecast for, or rather reduced its forecast for the reserves it needs to hold for bad loans. So that's an up arrow story. So there are good things going on across Europe, even though it looks like um, an equity, a little bit of an equity sell-off, Danny. Yeah, Matt, the, that banking story really strong there, releasing loan loss reserves. Seems like we've just skipped the credit default cycle. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you had other good stories. Schneider Electric raised its forecast in France. Essilor Luxottica raised its forecast as well. So there are some good earning stories out of Europe. Yep, the beats, they keep on coming out of Europe, Matt. Now a look at what's ahead today. We'll get the data out of the U.S. at 8.30 a.m. New York time. That's going to include personal income and spending rates, along with PCE inflation. Then later at 1 p.m., Bank Baker Hughes releases its U.S. rig count. And we'll also get more earnings, this time from ExxonMobil, Chevron, and Caterpillar, that big bellwether stock. Now, we also have a China Politburo meeting taking place in China with President Xi uh, on on Friday, about the second half economic worth, a lot of work, a lot of headlines coming through out of that, including their supervision system for listings overseas. Joining us to discuss is John Liu, Bloomberg News Executive Editor of Greater China, joining us from Beijing. John, what are the big takeaways so far with what we're hearing out of the Politburo meeting? So I think it's important to say that the Politburo is the 25 most powerful politicians in China getting together. They have a meeting a month includes Xi Jinping, includes the Premier Li Keqiang, includes uh, Liu He, uh, Xi's chief econ economic aide. Uh, and what they've decided is that they will uh, improve, uh, and I think that is a euphemism for increased scrutiny of overseas listings. Uh, that's obviously been in the headlines with Didi, with what's happened with the education tutoring companies. Uh, I think this is a sign that that scrutiny will continue into the second half. All right, John Liu, Bloomberg News Executive Editor of Greater China, breaking down that breaking news story. Thank you so much. Now let's turn to Amazon. It appears the company's pandemic bump is fading. The world's biggest online retailer missed quarterly sales estimates for the first time since 2018. Joining us now is Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Matt Bloxham. Matt, what do you make about, uh, of this miss right now? Yeah, well, I mean, it's quite a dramatic slowdown um, in sales growth. You know, the talking about 10 to 16 percent growth for Q3. The market was looking for 20 percent, and that's after in Q1 they grew at 44 percent, and the quarter just reported Q2 they were 27. So um, a really dramatic slowdown. You know, people are out in the streets buying stuff from real shops. 
Um, and you know, the CFO was quite cautious about you know, telling people that you should expect that muted growth for some quarters to come, uh, both as they kind of lap very strong quarters last year, but that you know, this kind of return to the old normal uh, carries on for some time. I, I, that's kind of a bummer. I thought a lot of this shopping was going to be sticky, Matt. I mean, we've signed up for subscriptions. <laughs> We're used to not having to lug you know, cases of Gatorade or beer or whatever. I don't know what you can buy on Amazon in this country. Mm -hmm. um, back to our <laughs> apartments so, so we have it coming. W why isn't it as sticky as it could have been? <laughs> I think, I mean, it's, I think it's a complex story, and I think that there definitely is a lot of stickiness, and I think, you know, the future trend is... Oh, it looks like we Matt, lost Matt Bloxham of Bloomberg Intelligence there, but breaking down the miss on the forecast from Amazon for us. Now let's turn to Robinhood, ending its first day as a public company 8.4% below its IPO price. This is after it failed to win over retail investors. Vlad Tenev, Robinhood's CEO and co-founder, spoke to us yesterday. We certainly are proud to have one of the largest retail allocations ever. And um, the way that we think about it is it's a long-term focused company and we're making decisions and making big bets uh, with the long-term interest of the business in mind. Let's get more on this with Shanali Basik, our Wall Street reporter. So Shanali, Robinhood rejected by the same people who use Robinhood. Yeah, in essence, right? They made 35% of their shares available in this IPO to retail investors. Only about 20 to 25 picked up on that. Still a big number. It's still huge. a huge number, yeah. exactly. And if you look at the numbers, Robinhood today at $29 billion is still worth more than Credit Suisse. <laughs> it's worth more than interactive brokers. It's three times as expensive as last year's earnings than interactive brokers and Schwab. <laughs> so the IPO itself, you never want to see an 8% drop in the IPO. That's the worst ever for a listing of its size. Uh, it reminds me of Uber, where also there was a drop. The right. underwriters were blamed pretty immediately for it. And, you know, Matt, you were asking all of yesterday, what does this mean for future performance? Uber is actually today trading, starting today below its IPO price. But it did actually rise. It just took a long time for Uber to recover from yeah. that. The same is true of Facebook. They had a pretty disastrous first day, and it took I don't know, a year before they really came back. Um, I think one of the most interesting things is that the underwriters made some shares available to short. That There was the option to do that, and there's a debate on the street as to whether or not that's a good strategy. Some people say why that could bring the, the price down. Others say it gives you a little bit of cushion because when the stock falls, those shorts cover and you can turn the momentum around. It's really interesting. This, in the weeks into the IPO, was a big source of conversation for investors and underwriters. When this happened with Lyft a while back, a lot of scrutiny around this. Uh, a lot of investors upset about it, but some who were able to gain from it, right? Uh, it seems like the perception around this, at least from the banking community, is starting to change. That maybe it should be made more available for different reasons for price stabilization. With that said, this is a retail stock as well, with a lot right. of retail interest who do not like short sellers. But if you can only buy and you can't sell, that's a problem. Remember, that's why retail investors are so angry yeah. at Robinhood, <laughs> because I, for a while they didn't allow them to sell their GameStop shares. I would love to see you personally duke it out with a retail trader <laughs> on this now. I, you know, a show I, we all I am a member. I am one of the uh, degenerates there on, on Wall Street Bets. Shanali Basak, thanks very much for joining us on uh, the Robin Hood story. President Biden now has made it officially announced yesterday that he'll require federal workers to prove they're vaccinated against the coronavirus, or they'll have to wear masks and submit to frequent testing. Let's listen in. Every federal government employee will be asked to attest to their vaccination status. Anyone who does not attest or is not vaccinated will be required to mask no matter where they work, test one or two times a week to see if they've, acqu they've acquired COVID, socially distance, and generally will not be allowed to travel for work. Joining us for more is Emily Wilkins, Bloomberg government congressional reporter. So. He doesn't quite go all the way. I mean, he's not really requiring um, that you get a vaccination. You just have to mask and test if you don't. 
Right. This isn't exactly a vaccine mandate here from the White House, but it is a bigger push that is coming at a point where the White House has sort of really been stuck. You know, initially for the first six months, we were seeing the rate of vaccinations really go up and up and up every day, peaking around April. But the Biden administration did not make their goal of getting at least 70 percent of American adults having at least one vaccination before July 4th. And since then, they've really been struggling trying to get a, the unvaccinated population to consider getting a vaccine, despite the fact they are so widely available in the U.S. President Biden also called on states to use funding that they had seen for, received from for the pandemic to use it to encourage individuals. He suggested states give individuals who are not yet vaccinated a hundred dollars if they go ahead and get that vaccine. Emily, another plea Biden has made is about this eviction ban that's up to expire soon. He's asking Congress, don't let it expire two days before it does. Is that enough time uh, to get this ban extended? It doesn't look like it at this point, but though Congress is certainly trying, Speaker Nancy Pelosi is working to attempt to potentially today move legislation that would expand that eviction moratorium until the end of the year. It's not yet clear if they're going to have the votes to do that. And then, of course, it's even a more tricky question when you get to the Senate. I mean, at this point, it looks like you would need all senators to be in agreement on it to pass it quickly enough to get it done by the time that that eviction expires on July 31st, tomorrow. And so it looks like this is something congressional leaders are going to attempt, but it also doesn't seem that they really have the timeline here to be successful on this. Mm -hmm. The White House really only requested yesterday that this eviction moratorium be extended. And, and in a body like Congress that moves as, as slow as it does, that's often not enough time. Millions of people could be facing a very harsh reality tomorrow. Emily Wilkins of Bloomberg Government, thank you so much. Getting back to the markets now, I want to take a quick check on some stocks moving in pre-market trading in the U.S. And the big underperformer is Pinterest, down a whopping 18%. <laughs> kind of a similar story to Amazon in that its pandemic boon seems to have ended. It actually lost 24 million users in the second quarter, leading to that plunge today. Also, that Amazon forecast miss is weighing on some other e-commerce stocks, one of them being Global E Online. It's down about 5.3% before the Bell. One stock moving to the upside, though, is Atlassian. It is a software company, and it's really benefiting from its shift toward the cloud. That led to a better outlook than expected, and as, as a result, that stock is up in early hours, Danny. Definitely one of the bright spots of this pandemic-related earnings season. It's all about the cloud, Kaylee. Now, coming up, we get more into this earnings season with Patrick Armstrong, Plurimi Wealth CIO. And later, we also have an exclusive interview with Air France KLM CFO Steven Zott. This is Bloomberg. We've got some breaking news now out of China. We told you earlier the Politburo has met and has some um, uh, some regulations, some advice for business there. And now they're saying they're going to deepen their anti-monopoly supervision of ride-hailing companies. Now, that's pretty specific, but it does feed into the general concern about more regulation, SNAP regulation in China, and begs the question, why would a Westerner invest here? Is it uninvestable at this point? Joining us now is Patrick Armstrong. He's a CIO of Plurimi Wealth. And I guess that's a pretty strong statement or a pretty strong question, Patrick. But when you have these kind of moves, you're reminded it's a communist country led by really one person. Is China investable, in your opinion? Um, it's probably going to become investable right now. I think it's um, there's some companies you definitely want to steer clear of. Uh, we still have a position in Tencent that we've held for most of the year, that maybe you can call it six cent now after the performance, but uh, incredibly cheap. If it was left to its own devices, the rule of law would uh, apply and market dynamics would determine its profitability, but that's, that's really not the case. So I'm continuing to hold it on its valuation, expecting there will be almost an end game from China where we'll have a little more clarity on what they're trying to achieve. They're definitely trying to disrupt any companies that have monopolistic characteristics. And Tencent's one that we own that probably falls into that basket. On the other side of things, we've been playing it. We're, we're currently short Metuan. 
huh. in short, Cal Education that we just closed out after its uh, big share okay. price collapse. But it it's difficult, but valuations are there, but it, it's unpredictable as well. So let's talk about some stocks, tech stocks here in the U.S. that are decisively not cheap. Do you want to own mega cap tech right now, Patrick? Um, they're great companies, no question about that. But I don't think the leadership's going to come from tech anymore. I think uh, you want to be in cyclical growth if you want outsized returns, if you want stable companies that are trading at premium multiples that probably are fairly valued. I think that's what tech is right now. So Alphabet had a great quarter. Facebook had a great quarter. Stocks really didn't move on incredible results. Um, if you look at consensus rank ratings for these companies, Amazon, 55 mm -hmm. analysts cover it. 54 of them had it as a buy going into last night's so earnings on, on Alphabet, very similar ratios. Yeah, Patrick, I mean, if you think about what's been happening in markets in terms of what people are investing, I mean, passive is so, so massive at this moment. How acute is concentration risk when we start to see some of these big cap tech stocks sell off when so many people own them through passive vehicles? Yeah, passive is 25% um, of the S&P is a lot of these big cap tech companies right now. And um, retail investors who uh, are the other force, you've got passive investors and retail investors are the driving forces of markets right now. And they're all attracted to these uh, companies because they use them every day, they understand them. And uh, you've never really had many negative consequences to owning them. So I think Amazon, you're going to get a bit of a shakeout today. And uh, it is incredibly concentrated. Um, these companies haven't let people down for years and years and years. They've delivered outsized returns. There's massive amount of profits that will be booked, I think. And my view is that we're going to have a continued reflationary backdrop. Yeah. And companies like ArcelorMittal, which reported yesterday, had great earnings, a great forecast. Facebook had great earnings, lowered its forecast. ArcelorMittal is trading at three and a half times forecast earnings. Patrick, there's always a little bit of trepidation when we're bouncing around all-time highs like this, when we see valuations rise like this. But will we grow into it, do you think? Are all-time highs bullish? Um, for me, the biggest risk for markets are the multiples. I, I think the earnings growth is going to be strong, liquidity is going to be strong, negative yields, yield, all of that supports markets. Tapering is going to happen, and I think there will be some multiple contraction. But I think earnings growth will offset that. Um, that's why we're really positioning into companies that are growing earnings but aren't trading at record multiples. And um, I think you're not going to have a collapse of these companies, but I think it's going to be a pause where basically the earnings catch up with the, the market cap valuations. Um, so I'm not mm. really worried about equities. Liquidity, negative real yield, strong economic growth, as long as those three pillars remain in place, I think the path of least resistance is higher equity prices. All right. A little hint of bullishness there to close out your Friday. Patrick, thank you so much. That's Patrick Armstrong, CIO at Florimi Wealth. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Danny Berger in London. Francine Lacqua is off this week. Now let's get the first word news. And in Hong Kong, a protester has been sent to prison for nine years in the first ruling involving that sweeping national security law imposed by China. The man was convicted of crashing his motorcycle into police officers while flying a protest flag. There's a new report about just how bad the coronavirus's Delta variant really is. According to the Washington Post, it appears to cause more serious illness and spreads as easily as chickenpox. The Post cites an internal CDC presentation, which says unpublished data show vaccinated people infected with the variant may be able to transmit the virus as easily as the unvaccinated. In the UK, the signs that they're, the so-called pingdemic is starting to ease. That refers to the official mobile phone contact tracing apps that ping workers and tell them to self-isolate. One reason may be that infection rates are falling or people could just be deleting the app. And for the first time, Germany will allow certain institutional funds to invest billions in crypto assets. So-called special funds with fixed investment rules may out as much as 20% of their assets in Bitcoin and other digital currencies. The funds can only be accessed by investors such as pension companies and insurers. And coming up, Air France reporting optimistic earnings as travel continues to pick back up. Our exclusive interview with the CFO is next. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London alongside Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. Francine Lacroix is off this week. Matt, look, I know it's been a volatile week, but I'm sorry. The story gripping markets is Scarlett Johansson <laughs> suing Disney because they streamed her, her Black uh, Widow movie the same day that they also had a theatrical release, which means she had less profits. Yeah, well, I mean, she did already make $20 million, but I'm kind of on her side yeah. uh, on this one. You know, Disney yeah. has been doing this with a number of releases, and I believe they've actually settled out of court with other actors on this issue. They're streaming even though they promise in the contract to give a theatrical release first, and typically in the industry, apparently, that means 90 to 20 days in theaters. Now, they've hit back pretty hard at Scarlett saying that basically she's yes. heartless and doesn't care about people affected by COVID, but I think that's kind of a cop-out. Sad and distressing in its callous disregard for the horrific and prolonged global effects of yeah, the COVID-19 pandemic. That, that was business. their response. It's business, Disney. Yeah, all right. They know it. Yeah, yeah. It seems like a, it seems like a bad idea to k pick a fight with a celebrity. Kaylee, are the markets just selling off because everyone's sad for ScarJo? Is that what's happening? I mean, I don't think that people don't care about ScarJo, but I think they care about her <laughs> less than other things that are going on today, Danny. It is a risk off tone in markets really across the world. Part of that has to do with Amazon with a really disappointing forecast, and that's dragging on tech specifically. In Europe, we are off session lows. The stock 600 down by about five tenths of a percent or so, but almost every industry group is in the red and here in the U.S. it is NASDAQ 100 futures underperforming. They're down more than one percentage point. You are seeing a bid coming into the bond market down two basis points on the 10 year yield to south of 125 while the Bloomberg commodity spot index is at its highest since 2011. Now I mentioned Amazon with that disappointing forecast after the bell last night. It seems the pandemic boom for the company may be coming to an end with growth set to slow. That is dragging the stock down six percent in early hours and dragging on some other e-commerce stocks as well. One of them being Etsy. Biggest plunger to the downside in early hours, though, is Pinterest. It lost 24 million users in the second quarter, and as a result, that stock is down a whopping 20%. And then finally, Robinhood, of course, the big debut of yesterday, not greeted kindly by the public markets, Matt. It fell 8% yesterday. Looks like that will continue today. The stock down more than 1% in early hours, Matt. Do you know, I'm going to walk over to this chart because I feel like it's easier for our radio listeners to understand these charts when I... Uh, physically walk them through. We welcome our listeners on London DAB Digital Radio uh, every day at this hour. I've got here a chart of jet fuel over the last two years, and you can probably guess what it looks like even if you're not watching us on TV. It drops drastically as we go into the COVID lockdowns in March of 2020. And then it spikes a little bit after we thought maybe in the summer last year is this over. Um, and it kind of flattens out. But now it's been rising. Jet fuel demand is really climbing because travel is coming back. First off, it's just the leisure travel or leisure as uh, Danny's friends in London would say it, but <laughs> soon enough, business travel is going to come back, and it looks like the market is prepping for that. Joining us to talk about this is Steven Zott. He's the CFO of Air France KLM. They had great numbers in earnings today, um, and I want to just ask first off, Steven, when is business travel coming back? Do you see it coming back in certain regions, and how important is that to offsetting these gains in jet fuel prices? Good morning, everybody. Thanks uh, for that question. Uh, if you look at business travel at the moment, we are still having business class passengers in our uh, plane. So it is not that the business is over. We see actually an increase of demand probably in the future for leisure business demand, uh, because I think more and more people are interested in that product. It's very difficult to already forecast now the exact levels, because actually due to the COVID crisis, people are still not fully back in the office. And if people are not back in the office, they are not traveling yet fully for business travel. But still, especially on the, the segment, uh, which we sometimes forget, which is the small and medium sized enterprises, you see that the business traffic is still in because they need to visit customers or they need to visit their plant. How long will it take to see a full demand recovery in that segment, though? That is, uh, that, it, I, I, that, that is uh, very difficult to, uh, to tell at the moment. Uh, of course, uh, in the future, there will be maybe an impact for the, the people who are working from home. But at the end of the day, I've, I've been here already in the airline industry. When they start video conferencing, everybody told us that there will be a reduction of demand of business travel. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen. 
We had the same question after the credit crisis. Everybody said it's over with the business travel. It didn't happen if you look at the numbers, for instance, in 2017. So people are more human than we think, and there is a big need to see each other. So uh, let's wait for it. And uh, at the end of the day, we can always reconfigure our planes for it if necessary. Of course, one hurdle to that, to getting back to normal, are U.S. travel rules. Uh, on the call, Ben Smith, your CEO, talking about uh, Air France asking for that reciprocity from the U.S. How confident are you that you will get the U.S. lifting some of its restrictions from traveling overseas? Yeah, let's, let's first start that we are very happy that people from the U.S. can travel into Europe who are vaccinated. And we've seen that already, that we could increase our capacity and increase the load factor from the U.S., which is a crucial market for us. So I think that was a very positive sign. And we have only now, let's say, 50 percent of the market traveling. And we are already at load factors of 60 percent which usually is maybe not that good, but given the current cargo prices, it gives a big contribution, a flight contribution to our profitability. Of course, it's crucial that also the U.S. opens uh, to the EU, and uh, we, are hopefully, uh, we are hoping for that, that it will be soon the case that vaccinated people get into Europe from the U.S., because I think there's no reason that vaccinated people could not travel. Let me ask you a speculative question here. If you continue to see problems um, with travel restrictions if we continue to see flare-ups of COVID and business travel doesn't come back. Do you have a plan to offset that revenue stream? Because it's pretty important to um, your airline, to all airlines. Yes. Yes. Now, let's, let's say uh, what we see is that there is a big appetite to travel. So everywhere where people can travel, we see immediately bookings coming in. And you have seen our very high level of ticket sales in the, in, in the second quarter, which supported that we, at the end of the day, were cash flow positive for the first time since the crisis. Uh, what will offset a part of the loss of the normal traffic is the very strong cargo. Because if there's less passenger business in, we can fly more cargo planes. So that's the first way to offset it. And, and at the end of the day, for uh, our subsidiaries or for our airlines, Air France and KLM, we have still furlough systems in place and we are still busy to restructuring our company. Hey, so hey. we are offsetting it in the cost. Well, I just want to say yesterday I was talking to Guillaume Sorry. Ferre uh, and he's talking about, you know, the new A350 wide body, making that into a freighter. Would you be an inaugural customer for Airbus's A350? Is that a possibility? We are, we are uh, looking at all possibilities of fleet, of course. Uh, we are not an operator of a big freighter uh, capacity. So what we are doing, we have a very strong and global network, and we have a lot of belly capacity in our passenger business planes, and we support that by some freighters. So we have some freighters in Paris. We have only two now in Paris. We had uh, up to three to four in Amsterdam. And we use those freighters to support our activities at the belly. And we are currently investigating what we could do to actually take advantage of the current market conditions. But we don't talk about a number of planes. It is maybe it, we talk about just one plane to support our belly capacity. When will you get a new age package from the Dutch government, Stephen? So there are currently discussions uh, with the European uh, Commission, which are, uh, uh, which are going in the right direction. Uh, I can not give any specific date at this moment, but we are very close working to the Dutch state, uh, uh, but because it's actually a discussion between the Dutch state and the European Commission. Stephen, thanks very much. Um, I suppose if I asked where you are going with your, with your new order for 160 planes, you wouldn't tell me. Does Boeing? or Airbus have the edge on that? <laughs> I cannot give you any answer on that. We love both uh, uh, manufacturers, uh, and we are looking forward for the prices we get for this uh, order. All right, you know I had to try, Stephen. Thanks very much. Hope we can get you back on the program. Stephen Zott there is the CFO of Air France KLM. Now, coming up, Robinhood's disappointing debut, the trading app failing to win over some of the very retail investors it's courting for long-term growth. Maybe you expected that after the GameStop saga. More next. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later on today, Visa Chairman and CEO Al Kelly. That's at 9.30 a.m. in New York, 2.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. It's really humbling uh, that six short years after we launched our, our product to the public, um, we have over 22 million customers and we're on this journey with our customers and uh, allowing them to participate in, uh, in the offering. And speaking of your customers, you said you'd allocate 20 to 35 percent for Robinhood's own users. We're hearing that somewhere in the range of 20 to 25 percent, still one of the biggest allocations ever. How did you get to that number? And, and are you concerned at all about volatility? Well, uh, we, we certainly are proud to have one of the largest retail allocations ever. And um, the way that we think about it is it's a long-term focused company and we're making decisions and making big bets uh, with the long-term interest of the business in mind. So um, volatility you know, comes and goes and we're, we're not going to be commenting too much on daily fluctuations of the stock price. That was Vlad Tenev, Robinhood CEO and co-founder, speaking to Bloomberg's Emily Chang yesterday. Of course, the trading app went public, debuted yesterday, and recorded the worst one on record for an IPO of its size. Joining us now is Barry Ritholtz, Bloomberg Opinion Columnist and Ritholtz Wealth Management Chairman and Chief Investment Officer. Barry, I just want to get your hot take. What did you make of Robinhood's debut yesterday? Well, two things. First, the shorter term issue is clearly they were a pandemic play with people home and bored. And as the world began to reopen, there's less of that. There's less boredom trading, casino. Let, instead of Vegas, let's play with our Robin Hood app, app. But the bigger issue, the structural issue, is companies have been staying private for longer. Every time they do a round, their valuation goes up. And it's pretty clear that this valuation reached a point where there was no appetite for it amongst public investors. If you're gonna stay private that long and have your valuation far exceed your competitors, well, don't be surprised when there's no IPO pop. Yeah, you know, much has been made of um, retail investors kind of poo-pooing the IPO, you know, the first day of trading, although it should be mentioned, of course, that I think like 25% took shares pre-IPO. I, I wonder what institutional, the institutional view of Robinhood is, Barry, because no matter how you see it, even if you're unhappy about the gamification of investing, this is a game changer in so many ways, right? I mean, they changed the way institutional investors short stocks. Um, they certainly changed the conversation on pay for order flow. Um, <laughs> They changed the way Gen Z is investing. No, you're shaking your head. No, no, no. I, I'm on the other side of the trade on, on most of that. So first, uh, it, it resurrected the debate about payment for order flow. But when we see surveys of investors, hey, which would you prefer, payment for order flow or do you want to pay a commission up front? And the vast majority of investors would rather have it be invisible and not see it. Pay and cheaper, order flow. frankly. You and, I, and cheaper. We, we've discussed this. It narrow yeah. spreads. It's somebody's got to pay for that massive infrastructure. If it's not a commission, it's going to be paying for overflow. Number one. Number two, I don't think so. So what you could give credit to Robinhood for is doing what Chuck Schwab forecast 40 years ago, 30 years ago in the early 90s. Charles Schwab, I think it was his. Um, First, first biography said he thinks eventually trading will become free. And that turned out mm. to be true. Robinhood has been doing this since 2015, free trading. But it wasn't until Schwab came out and announced two years ago, hey, we're going to take buy TD and become a massive custodian and um, broker that really free trade had, went everywhere, it reverberated throughout the market, and it forced everybody um, to up their game and to lower their their costs. So I don't even know how much credit Robert Hood well, what about, get, should get for this. Well, what about, you know, hedge funds are going to short stocks differently. They're going to be paying attention. And maybe this is more of a Wall Street bets um, innovation uh, than, than Robin Hood per se. But you've got this retail army now that's going to go and try and squeeze shorts. Isn't, isn't that something that people have to pay attention to these days? 
Well, the lesson, I think people are drawing the wrong lesson from uh, the Reddit phenomena and, and GameStop. My takeaway is, hey, and I say this as someone who was short a lot of the stocks that imploded in 08, 09, and watching those last few dollars below 10, 10 was a nightmare because it's so squeezable, even as these companies were going out of business, uh, don't short um, stocks under $10 that have collapsed 90% and, and have a massive uh, outstanding short interest. That's the takeaway. The fact that a bunch of people figured out, hey, we could do this with options and create a gamma squeeze beyond just a regular short squeeze. Uh, you know, people have been taking pot shots at, at shorts for a long time. Look at what took place with um, Bill Ackman and and Carl Icahn when he realized, right. hey, here's a massive short position. And Barry, I, if I could get a little momentum, we'll squeeze that up and, and move the stock but, but, higher. Barry, can I play can I play devil's advocate for you a little sure. bit? Okay, maybe this isn't a new phenomenon uh, in terms of you don't want to short anything with a massive short interest. But if you look at the attitude of a lot of these people, I mean, Matt Miller is over there on Wall Street bets. It's all about diamond hands. You hold, you brag <laughs> about your losses, you don't give up. I mean, who's to say that this isn't a just big shift, maybe a generational shift of Are people you not signed who up, get passionate Danny? about companies? Are you not? I am signed up. Yeah, I am okay. signed okay, up. I, I am. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm not so, there's 11 my million degenerates on, but, on there. <laughs> We're all degenerates. So, so, so first, this first, there's nothing different between this and what we saw in the 1990s with the Yahoo message boards. iOmega is the poster child of diamond hands, where individual investors were literally driving out to the company's parking lot on a Sunday afternoon, and hey, it's full of cars. They're working triple shifts, and eventually, you know, the the investing public was way ahead of the Wall Street analysts. But you know, you could show me a handful of companies where the public can get ahead of Wall Street on stuff like this. Let's not forget, there are tens or if not hundreds of billions of dollars at risk, thousands of very smart people, really highly equipped with the greatest technology and you know, a really amazing infrastructure. It's exceedingly difficult to beat that yep. crew Mm. Um, on a regular yeah. basis. So let's just be wary of extrapolating from a handful of companies. Hey, I find right. the Reddit phenomena fascinating. And it's, you know, it's not, I don't think Vanguard or BlackRock are losing sleep over a handful of, of narrative okay. driven right. stocks that have done really well pushed by, right. by Reddit. Barry, unfortunately, we're out of time. Great to have you on this. That's Barry Ritholtz, Bloomberg Opinion Columnist and Ritholtz Wealth Management Chairman and Chief Investment Officer. This is Bloomberg. What we're seeing is a good recovery in the economy as, as we open up. So we're cautiously optimistic about the recovery, but, but strong performance across all of our businesses driven by an increase in lending with mortgage growth. The, the mortgage market here remains very strong. And as we come out of lockdown, consumer spending is starting to recover back to pre-COVID levels and our commercial business continues to provide strong support. So what we're seeing is, you know, very low level of default defaults. Businesses have been remarkably resilient. There's a lot of support still in the economy, but as we come out of lockdown, confidence is coming back and we see more optimistic outlook for the economy and very low levels of default, but, uh, you know, a strong and resilient performance. And obviously we have a very strong capital position, a capital accretive position. So that allows us to uh, pay dividends and capital distributions to shareholders. Good morning, Alison. As you said, it's some great results across the board there. And I can see that there's a plan of a £750 million buyback in the second half of this year. If the next quarter is just as strong and you continue to accumulate these excess uh, capital, what will you do with that excess capital? Will you accelerate buyback programmes further beyond what the government's directing? Or will you uh, turn to M&A or some other way of returning capital to shareholders? Yeah, we've set a medium term target to be at a 13 to 14 percent CET one ratio, which is, is the right shape for a business like ours with very good risk diversification and, and a balanced book. So we have a clear path and my clear preference is 
to distribute capital to shareholders, but also to continue to invest for growth within our business. And we're seeing you know, good growth across that and potential for more organic growth. And then we will also consider any other options that add to shareholder value. But I think hopefully what we've given to the market is a clear indication of a steady capital return. We're investing $3 billion into the business for growth over the next three years in our digital transformation. And we will always consider options that add shareholder value as well. What are NatWest's plans for office space if work from home or at least a hybrid structure is more the future? Will you keep your Bishopsgate campus and your Edinburgh campus? Um, yes, we will keep those two campuses. I mean, we're evolving our um, working into a more hybrid way of working. I think certainly COVID has busted a few myths about how you can work. Um, we were able to get 50,000 people working from home and continue to support, you know, good operational performance and customer support during that period. So our, our, our offices are evolving into more hybrid spaces, more flexible working, um, but there will always need, uh, always be a need for offices. There will always uh, be a need for collaboration and, and bringing people together. So our, our footprint will evolve, but, you know, uh, our two big campuses are not going to change. All right, so the Bishopsgate campus is safe. That was NatWest CEO Allison Rose speaking with Bloomberg's Mark Cudmore earlier today after the company beat earnings forecasts in the second quarter. Um, bringing it back to New York, Danny, I yeah. will be back in New York next week. I'm staying. I was going to go back to Berlin, but I figured, you know what, the yeah. action is here. So why, you know, why go back? Perfect for time for you to check out that frothy housing market in New York, Matt. Yeah, I'm going to look in Bronxville. Actually, if any viewers have a place in Bronxville for me, go ahead and shoot me an IB. Coming up, Jan Hatzius, Goldman Sachs chief economist. This is Bloomberg.